were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled, frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as you see that I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. And he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law and the prophets. And then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. And then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Oh God, as we uh, consider this uh, narrative, as always, we're praying for insight and understanding into uh, these relationships you're inviting us into with you, with ourselves, and with each other. We pray for your blessing today, in your name, amen. It's great to see everyone here today. It is Mother's Day weekend. I hope you're doing something nice for your mother. I think you see a lot of Avon Hopers who are gone today, probably visiting their mothers, and then we see some people here with their mothers and parents. I'm so glad that you all came. Good to have everybody here. We have our friend, by the way, Nick Miller from Andrews University. Nick, old OG Avon Hofer from Days Gone By. Good to have you back. We've got Josh. Josh and, and Michael are here. I, where's where's uh, Danny? I think we can have a building committee meeting for the first time, and that's great. So nice to see you and family today. Glad everybody's here. We've got a great Zoom uh, crowd online. Looks like my mom's even on. Happy Mother's Day tomorrow, mom. Yes, thank you, yeah. Um, Okay, so our, you know, we're still in the Easter season. We're reflecting on the implications of the the life, the death, the rest, the resurrection and ascension of Jesus uh, today. And so next week, we'll coming to a close of this season. Next week is Pentecost, 50 days from Easter, and so uh, Michelle will be leading us next week. And so our text of emphasis today comes from uh, this, this uh, scene on the day of the resurrection. Jesus, as you may remember, if you've read the story, he had appeared to two disciples who were leaving Jerusalem downcast because as far as they knew, Jesus was dead, and uh, Jesus showed up walked with them, they didn't recognize him, he reveals himself to them, and so they rush back into the city of Jerusalem, and they are meeting with the other disciples, and uh, that is when we get to our text of emphasis today, again, Luke chapter 24, starting with verse 36, but jumping to 37, we're told that they were startled and frightened, thinking that they saw a ghost, so they're in the room, they're getting this report from the other disciples, and uh, Jesus uh, shows up, and so he is able to, to uh, zip around, apparently, at, at this time, but he is in his, his human, humanness, he's human, and so they're surprised, they're shocked, I love the, uh, the idea here that they're, they're, they didn't believe because they were so amazed and overjoyed, and so Jesus is like, look at my hands, my hands and feet, so the nail scars are there, it is Jesus, he is human as he ever was. In fact, we know all the way up to the ascension, Jesus remains human. He's human now. He's in a human form. And so Jesus is identifying himself, and he does the most human thing you could possibly do. They're questioning, so they see the hands, they see the feet, and they're still amazed, they're still unsure that Jesus is real. And uh, I don't know what their theology was about ghosts, but uh, they think he's some kind of manifestation or ghost. And to prove him, uh, himself human, he does the most human thing possible 
he eats. Do you, do you have something to eat? And so we can imagine them quickly looking around, and I don't know, there's some scraps of, you know, filet of fish around, and they're like, okay. And so they give a Jesus a broil of fish, and he eats uh, the fish. Great scene. By the way, these, if you've been following along in the stories, and by the way, you can go back at avonhope.org, and we've got all of our uh, worship teaching times there. You'll see a theme of Jesus eating with the disciples after the resurrection. You know, a couple weeks ago, we talked about him making breakfast on the beach. So again, here we have uh, Jesus proving his humanness through eating together. And so he shows up, he's there, and uh, then we're told that he opened their minds. He opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. And so what's going on here? Is Jesus, you know, doing some, you know, mystical uh, spell on them so that they can understand what's going on, what the scriptures are, are all about? I would assert to you, no, if you continue in the text, it says, he told them, this is how he opened their mind. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead. Now, he's alluding to a number of passages in the Hebrew Bible, right? Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, all talk about uh, the Messiah suffering, okay? So he's, he's now explaining what the Hebrew Bible had, had been talking about. So he's opening their mind. This is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and the repentance and the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. You've seen these things. And so Jesus explained in very, very simple terms the good news. The good news. God has interjected himself into the human story. Uh, Jesus is the long sought after Messiah. He suffered, but he rose again, and now there is forgiveness for sins through repentance. This is the good news. It's a very, very simple concept. It is the heart of Christianity, this simple idea that God didn't leave us on our own, even though we chose to go on our own, our own way, but he has come in, in, in Jesus. And in Jesus, we have hope for the future. And so throughout his ministry, Jesus was inviting uh, people to believe in this, believe in this idea. It's simple. It's simple. Um, consider this. This is John chapter uh, 6. Jesus is interacting with the crowd, and they asked him, what must we do to do the works that God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one that he sent. Jesus continually, throughout his own teaching, teaches a very, very simple uh, theological construct. God loves the world. He, he, he sent his son, his Messiah, to save the world. And our job is to believe in the one that he has sent. In John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, again, an interaction with a woman. And he, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? These are just a few examples of Jesus' invitation in his own teaching to believe in him. This is what Jesus is teaching. Believe in me. I am the one that God has sent. I am the Messiah. I have to come to forgive sins. Your job is to believe in me. Okay. And so Jesus is inviting every human into relationship with him, a relationship of trust, a relationship that believes that God has done for us and what we cannot do for ourselves, and he's interjected himself into this story, and this concept is, quite frankly, pretty simple. It's pretty simple. Now, the problem, of course, is that humans have found a way to take a rather simple concept. Now, I'm not saying that the, the ability for this concept to exist is simple. It took a whole lot of work. Jesus had to die for this. So there was a lot of suffering in the world to get to this point. But the basic concept that God has fixed things through Jesus and all we have to do is express faith in, in God's work in Jesus, that's pretty simple, okay? The problem is humans have found a way to take this very, very simple uh, construct, this simple idea, this simple faith and make it complicated. And so that leaves us to our, our, our question today. <laughs> what fools people into believing that Christian faith is complex? 
what fools people, what, 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 what convinces them that Jesus' simple gospel, his simple good news is actually very, very complex. So you know I love three, so I've got three responses. I'm sure we could come up more if we could, if, you know, if we could get Nick Miller and we could, the, the, we could come up with some other good theology, but I've only got three for us today, Nick, so later on we can, you know, we can discuss more reasons that people are fooled into thinking that Christianity is some complex idea. Anyway, the first one is this, Christians, okay, so we're just gonna be honest about, for those of you who identify as a Christian, recognize not everybody here may be in that boat, but if you identify Christians, this is the problem that Christians have had. Christians have made rituals and practices the primary thing. And so this fools people into thinking that Christianity is complex because oftentimes our practices and, and our rituals are complex. And the, when the rituals and the practices overshadow the simple gospel, the thing that Jesus is inviting us into, this invitation to believe in him, it becomes complex. Now, this is not the first time in human history this has happened. In fact, if you go back to the Hebrew Bible, and uh, you go specifically to the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 1, so Isaiah was a messenger of God to uh, uh, you know, a group of people way back in the, what, the, 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 what, what, the 5th, 6th, 7th century BC. Um, I should have done the re re refresh on that when, uh, when Isaiah wrote, but you know, you got the idea. It was a long time ago. Okay, so uh, anyway, Isaiah is communicating with uh, the uh, people, and uh, he starts with this message. So this is a message from God to this group of people. Okay, I, this is Isaiah 1, uh, verse 13. Get ready. Buckle your seatbelts. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. This is God now talking through Isaiah. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Now, just take a step back here for a second. Okay, so this is Isaiah in talking somewhere in the middle of the first millennium BC, okay? Now, before that time, God had actually instructed this same group of people to do some of these practices. He had initiated them. Now, they're practicing, and he's like, I can't take it anymore. They become detestable to me, these convocations, these Sabbaths, these new moon feasts. And then, I mean, what is more dear to a religious person than prayer? You know, if you're a religious person, almost of any religious persuasion, the idea that prayer is important is there, right? <laughs> God is now saying, when, when you pray, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer prayers, I am not listening. God is disturbed in Isaiah 1 over these rituals and practices and it all goes back to what's happening. They have overshadowed the meaning of what God is trying to do among his people. And we still wrestle with this today when our rituals and practices overshadow the simple good news that God is working on behalf of humankind and inviting us into a relationship with him, a, a saving relationship with him, a rescuing re relationship with him, then those rituals and practices become pr problematic. It happened in Isaiah's time in chapter one. It happens in our time too. And it makes Christianity far more complex than the Christianity that Jesus initiated. A Christianity is rooted in this idea that our job is to confess faith in the one God has sent, the Lord Jesus, who's done for us that what we cannot do. And so, in Jesus' time, again, this was still relevant. You may remember the, the story that Jesus is dealing with some of the religious leaders. They had been experts in rituals and practices, and he said, you study the scriptures diligently. There's another thing we like to do, study the Bible. Religious people love to study the Bible. He says, Jesus, you study the scripture diligently because that you think in them there's eternal life, these are the very scriptures that testify about me, and yet you refuse to come to life in me. Jesus is saying you can, again, the rituals and practices, prayer, Bible study, worshiping together, it doesn't, it, it's actually too complex unless it's helping build faith in the one God has sent. And so we make uh, Christianity complex when we focus on the rituals and rules and let them overshadow this, this simple invitation that Jesus himself is inviting us into. Okay, 
Secondly, what fools us into believing that Christian faith is complex, the ancient human struggle with the idea that we have to fix ourselves fools us into thinking Christianity is complex. When we think we have to fix ourselves and that that's our primary job is to get our act together, and this is a, an ancient problem, it's also a problem that transcends almost every philosophical and religious system in the world. Everyone, I'm being a little bit broad, but most people have some sense that you know, something needs to change in the world, in, in uh, their community, in their village, or in themselves, right? And so when we get caught up in the idea that we have to work on this, we have to fix this on our own, then that makes our religious system complex, and this happens for Christians. I've heard Christians say, uh, Adventist Christians even say, you say, you know, Jesus' invitation that, uh, you know, forgiveness of sins is, 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 an, is an invitation that we come into, but that is only relevant for the sins that happened in your past. It's not for the future. I've heard Christians say this, you know, so the idea is, again, you know, it's one thing when you come to believe in Jesus and you're like, okay, forgive my sins and God forgives us our, our sins, but everything after that, the essence is you're on your own. You gotta fix yourself going forward. Of course, this is not true. Jesus is inviting us into a relationship that is not just about the past, but the present and the future. Jesus is inviting us into a relationship that affects our entire experience, not just what's happened in our past. And so, you know, when we feel like we have to fix ourselves, it makes our religious experience complex. Why? Because fixing yourself is difficult. It's inherently, have you ever tried to fix yourself? You know, the newest research says that it takes 66 days to uh, establish one habit. So you wanna change a habit, <laughs> it's gonna take you 60, first they say, okay, it's 21 days, three weeks, you establish a new, new habit. Then the, then the researchers came and said, you know, actually we've, we've investigated human behavior, 66 days is the average, but it actually could be anywhere from 34 to 256 days to change one habit in your experience. How many things do you wanna change about yourself? How many things do you wanna change about your uh, community that you exist in? How many things would you like to change about the world? 60 to 60 days for one little habit, it's difficult. If we have to rely on ourselves to fix ourselves, no wonder we think religion or faith is complex. But this is not what Jesus is inviting us into, something that we're on our own trying to fix ourselves. But when we think that, it makes our faith experience far, far more com complex than what Jesus is inviting us into. Finally, what fools us into believing that our Christian faith, or Christian faith is complex, is that Christians have over-intellectualized faith. It's, it's a head experience. We like to study. We like to read. Now, don't get me wrong. I have a office right there, and it is ridiculously full of books that are falling over on the floor. I don't have, because I like to read books about ideas and things, okay? You know, it's, it's, it's one of my things, all right? I know some of you are into this uh, uh, too, and so, but and then, or you come to the Bible studies. We had the adult Bible study class just a few minutes ago, and we study the Bible, and we talk about ideas and concepts, and we're all into this, and it's very interesting. There are many interesting things that are happening in the Bible. Many of you study. I know there, there are Bible students who spend their entire career, their focus on one small little text in the Bible. They'll study, they'll know everything about that text, and so it's fine, it's well, and it's good. But if your Christianity is rooted in experience where you have to be uh, intellectual about every aspect of the Bible, it's missing out on the good news that is very simple. And so when we over-intellectualize our faith, we make it something that is so complex and it's into the uh, details, there are some uh, ancient Christian prophecies. You almost have to laugh at Christians, uh, there was a, uh, what's called the Great Schism. Anybody know when the Great Schism happened? East and West churches divided. Ten Very good, Very, thank you, oh yes, yeah, thank you, yeah, yeah. That was just for you, 1054, that's right, 1054, Great Schism, East, West uh, church divided. There was a, a number of issues, but one of the issues was whether the spirit which Jesus talked about in our passage today. Remember, he said, wait 
and he, he was implying that the spirit is going, going out. One of the issues in 1054 was whether the spirit goes out from the father or the son. Smart people got together and wrestled for weeks trying to decide, does it, now is it from the, does just the father, or does the son also get to send the spirit out? Schism, the church broke into two, two, two parts. Okay, my, my, uh, my other favorite one is transubstantiation versus consubstantiation. Anybody know? Nick, you're out. You're, okay, okay, all right. Okay, one idea is the Eucharist. So that's the Lord's Supper. We celebrate that together. One group said, you know, when to celebrate the body and the blood, the bread and the wine actually becomes the physical body of Jesus and the physical blood of Jesus. There's some implications of that, by the way. People who believe that believe that only special people can touch that. All right, so they can touch because it's now officially, when you're doing communion, uh, only the special people who have been designated can touch the bread. So they put it in your mouth because you cannot touch it. You, you familiar with what I'm talking about? Okay, you, you, you know that we're not into transubstantiation here because when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, you come to the table and we just hand, plop the bread in your hand, right? That's because we're with... We're with not exactly, but more with Martin Luther, who introduced the, the idea of consubstantiation, which says much more in the line with, it's a symbol. Jesus is present, he's present, but his body doesn't actually become the bread, or the bread and juice don't actually become his body. People are, were arguing for centuries about this. There's still an argument about this. See, these, these are ideas, intellectual ideas. How about the Immaculate Conception? Does Mary, Jesus' mother, <laughs> Does, did she have, uh, did, was she born with original sin or not? People argue for centuries about this. So in order for Jesus to be impure and holy, the idea is, this is appropriate for Mother's Day, that the mother also has to be pure and holy. And so she also cannot have any connection with sin. And so she doesn't have original sin. You get, you get what I'm saying? These are complex ideas. Some of this stuff is who knows? You, the, answer, the only answer is who knows? The other answer is who cares? <laughs> Now, we could say oh, well, all these ideas, they're, you know, Middle Ages, they didn't have Netflix and nothing else to do, so they were going to argue about, you know, consubstantiation versus transubstantiation. Yeah. But to today, we argue about things, too. Again, I love adult Bible study, I love study, but you get together with some Adventist Christians, and we come up with some really interesting ideas, and we love to argue about things and think about things. The problem is when we over-intellectualize faith, and good, use your intellect, absolutely, study. But Jesus is inviting us into a very simple relationship. Believe in me. I've done what you cannot do, believe in me. And so in that sense, we're talking about a very, very simple thing, a very simple relationship. Now, I'm not saying that there is not challenges to overcome for us to embrace that faith, to confess that faith, sure. We all have baggage, we have backgrounds, we've come from places, we've heard things, and overcoming that is difficult. But we need to know that what Jesus is inviting us into is simple. It took a lot of work for it to be real. Jesus had to die. He had to rest. He had to rise again. But our work, our job is simple. God is a God of consent, and that means he invites us into a relationship where we just accept what he's done for us and when we do that it makes a difference not just for what's happened in our past but for our present and for the future god inviting us into a relationship that is transformative so how do we embrace this will we go back to jesus himself in matthew chapter 11 he says this come to me all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. If you've thought that Christianity means that you have to get your act together and that you have to start acting in the right way morally before God can do anything in your experience, you can get rid of that. That's not the invitation that Jesus is asking for us. Jesus' invitation is believe in me. I've done for you what you cannot do for yourselves. And then when you believe in me and you confess faith in me, and by the way, that's not just a one-time this is a, a misconception that confessing faith in Jesus is something that happens once. This confession, like, by the way, any good relationship, is something that happens all the time. Imagine if, uh, 
my wife came to me and was like, what's going on? I haven't seen you, haven't talked to you. Uh, you never see, you say I love you anymore. And I'm like, well, I did 28 years ago in 1996 when we got married on August 11. That, that's not going to work, right? <laughs> we wouldn't have made it to almost 28 years if that's the experience. And so Jesus is inviting us in the same relate, kind of relationship. And that relationship is confessing faith all the time. I believe in the work that you've done for me. And I embrace that. I believe that you are who you, you are, said you are, and I want you to continue working on my, my experience. It's not something that happens once. And so this is our work, confessing faith. Jesus invites us to believe in me, in him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A Peter who was in that room when Jesus showed up, whose mind was opened, not by some mystical spell Jesus removed from them, but by Jesus explaining what he had done. Jesus, Peter articulated it like this, salvation, rescue, whatever word you want to use to get the point, salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to mankind but by which we must be saved. Peter got it. He understood that his mind was open and he recognized that it's not ritual and it's not a practice. It's not over intellectualizing things. It's belief in the one that God has sent. For God so loved the world. It's the belief. God so loved the world. He, God loves the world. Doesn't hate the world. He's not angry with the world. God so loved the world that he sent his only son into the world. That's Jesus. And everyone who believes in him, if you confess faith in Jesus, everyone who believes in him will not die forever, but will live forever. This is the invitation that Jesus is giving us today, that we can believe in him, and when we believe in him, it makes a difference. Our sins are forgiven. The Spirit works in us to transform who we are, and we have hope for the future. May God give you this faith today. Amen.